so I'm not being a crazy hippie by saying matter is energy. No, no, they're, they're, there's a constant between them, which is the speed of light squared, and that's it. E equals mc squared is not a hippie equation. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Chasing Consciousness. So today we've got the interesting job of trying to get to the bottom of the famous mystery of the wave-particle duality and see if along the way we can't bust a few myths about it. We're also aiming to get a better understanding of whether quantum mechanics can or can't help us to get closer to a complete theory of reality or not and hopefully find out if it can give us some clues about how matter and consciousness are related. We're also going to trace the developments and discoveries in quantum theory throughout its relatively young 100 or so year history. So who better to speak to about all of this than physicist John Butterworth, uh, one of Britain's most experienced subatomic particle physicists and a professor who is really loved for his gift of making physics accessible. John was born in Manchester, and he's currently Professor of Physics at UCL in London. But he has also worked at the Large Hadron Collider for years and years in Switzerland. And he tells the story of their long search for the Higgs boson particle at CERN in his book, Smashing Physics, if you're interested in the Large Hadron Collider. He often speaks publicly about particle physics, uh, got some brilliant talks on YouTube, particularly one at the Royal Institution I really recommend. Uh, he appears regularly on TV, including BBC's New Newsnight, Channel 4, Al Jazeera, and his new book, Atomland, which we'll be talking mostly about today, came out in 2018. Now, this subject of the wave-particle duality has fascinated and baffled me basically since I was a student of physics at school. So I, I literally couldn't wait to talk to John about this. So without further ado, let's go. John, welcome to Chasing Consciousness. Thank you for coming on the show. It's a pleasure, thanks. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out for it. I can only imagine how busy you are, especially after the discovery of the Higgs boson. When exactly did that happen? That must have been so satisfactory after all those years of anticipating its discovery. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I, I began working on the experiment about oh God, 20 years ago now, um, about the turn of the century. Um, and we, uh, we finally started taking data after a false start in 2009. And yes. we analyzed the data and then... The announcement of the discovery was in 2012, and of course the Nobel Prize followed for the theorists in the, the year after. Um, but we've been kind of continuing to take data then. I mean, really, uh, the discovery is the beginning of an exploration, right? I mean, you kind of break new ground and find a new object. The Higgs is such a such a fundamentally important object to our picture of the subatomic world, and is such a unique object in our in that picture. And there's nothing else. It's not like another quark or another lepton or another force, even. It's a completely unique object. Well, so, this is something, something once we've painted the picture uh, a little more clearly uh, via your, your new book, Atomland, hopefully we can come back to that at the end and it'll, yeah, sure. it'll make a bit more sense. Okay. So, John, um, your recent book, Atomland, I mean, it tells the story, I, I think probably quite specifically for the general public, mm -hmm. of the emergence of quantum physics and mapping each stage of its development using this, this really brilliant analogy of explorers discovering new continents as they go of, of Atomland uh, throughout the 20th century and into the 21st, mapping each type of particle you discovered right up to, the, to your most recent discovery of the, uh, the Higgs boson at, at CERN mm -hmm. in Switzerland. Um, it seems to me that this is a, a, that there's a real desire for people to try and demystify uh, the, the implications of, of quantum mechanics, and and I think you know you yourself and some other popular science writers are really trying to do that for us, and and I think it's I think it's high time. I think there's a real request out there to understand this better. Mm -hmm. So can you? Give us an introduction in this all-important first series where we're really setting the scene for the public. Give us a small arc of the, that you follow in the book Atomland uh, that takes us up to the present day. Sure. So um, the whole thing is, is very much, as you say, from the point of view of an explorer. And I'm an experimental physicist, and I think it's very important at the beginning of a discussion like this to remember that physics is an empirical science. It's completely rooted in... in going and looking and seeing what we see and then trying to make sense of it in terms of 
deeper ideas as, as to what might be leading to what we see. And that's the way the book is framed, as you say, this kind of exploration approach. So it, it begins, it has this kind of conceit in the book that you begin in the West, which is kind of everyday energies. And as you go further east, you're exploring um, higher energy and higher energy in, um, in quantum mechanics actually corresponds directly to smaller things. So there's mm. a, the, one of the key concepts in the book is this, this relationship between energy and distance, which is fundamentally a quantum mechanical relationship. But you can, you can do it from a classical analogy in that if you have a very high frequency, then you have a very short wavelength. And if yeah. you have a very short wavelength, you can see very small stuff. Ah. And the high frequency corresponds to you know, a high rate of vibration. That's, that's high energy. So there's this direct correspondence between high energy and small things. And this kind of ties together why we have these huge colliders which are really designed at seeing the smallest things in nature that we've ever seen. And kind of the biggest experiments correspond to the smallest things, and that's because we have to go to really high energy to get the resolution to see the small stuff. That makes so sense. The, the, so the, the, uh, the exploration in the book in Atomland begins with the electron. That was the first subatomic particle discovered more than 100 years ago now by J.J. Thompson. And... The key thing about that is not just that it was the first subatomic particle, but that it became very clear very quickly that to understand the way electrons behave, the classical analogies we had of, of snooker ball-like particles or, or, or water-like waves just don't work. You need aspects of both of them to understand the electron. Mm. And that gives you the whole, you know, the, the let into um, atom land, basically, which is the, atomic, the world of atomic physics. Where really, even to understand the periodic table and to understand chemistry and how atoms interact, you have to take into account that the electron is not um, a particle or a wave in the classical sense. It's something else. It's some other kind of object that has um, has aspects of wave-like properties and aspects of particle-like properties. And that's how you that's how we understand, you know, the orbitals around, of the electrons around an atom and, mm. and the fact that those are quantized leads directly to the whole of chemistry and they're only quantized because the, the electron is neither a wave nor a particle. Right. And then the rest of the map, kind of, you go further east, you go further up in energy, so you look inside the nucleus, you see that there are protons and neutrons in there, you see that um, they are in turn made of quarks. Um, and then as far as we know, quarks and the electron and its friends, the, the muon and the tau, are fundamental. And so no matter how far we've gone up in energy, no matter how, how far we've tried, we've never managed to break an electron. We've never seen any internal structure in an electron or a quark. Now, like anything else in science, that's a provisional statement. The next big experiment may, may find that you know, we, if we increase the resolution again, then actually we do see that there's another layer of structure. But currently, we have a a theory of the fundamental constituents of nature, which are not made of anything else and everything else is made of them, which is what's outlined in the book. And this, we call it the standard model of particle physics because we're, we're pretty bad at naming things. I mean, the, <laughs> <laughs> the Big Bang's a pretty dull name for, and, and so is the standard model, but they're both remarkable um, scientific uh, um, ideas and achievements, actually. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, then that, and the, the book, of course, then ends in the Far East with the discovery of the Higgs and then kind of leaves us peering out from the east coast of the known land further east to higher energies to know, we know the standard model isn't the whole story. We have um, very good observational evidence that, that it's not a theory of everything, there's more out there. Right. Uh, but we don't know where it is and we're kind of, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, which is my experiment in CERN, is um, is currently exploring that eastern seaboard and seeing where, what's out there. And um, could you could you let us know briefly what kind of things appear to be missing from your model? Sure. Um, the I mean, the I most egregious one really is the fact that our list of fundamental forces in this kind of quantum mechanical standard model doesn't include gravity. So we we don't have a way of incorporating gravi gravity in the same language. Um, in the same quantum mechanical language, basically, as the uh, the other forces. Oh, no, that's so a that's a pretty big gap. Um, the, the, we have a very good theory of gravity, of course, which is Einstein's general relativity, but it's fundamentally a classical theory. It doesn't really, um, it doesn't lend itself to quantization in the way that, say, Maxwell's electromagnetism 
led to quantum electrodynamics, and, we, and that's now part of the standard model. We right. haven't been able to do the same thing with Einstein's um, general relativity. And people like Carlo Rovelli are trying hard, aren't they? But they haven't quite well, got plenty it. of people trying. Yep, yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, yeah, Carlo is is kind of the uh, working on loop quantum gravity stuff, um, and uh, with Lee Smolin and other people. I'd say the main the main bulk of particle theory is still focused on string theory and M theory type solutions, and there are people doing other things as well. But yeah, that's so far our ship hasn't. Our, the, we, our, you know, I said at the beginning, physics is an observational science. So far, those people are unfortunately working without, just with mass to guide them at some level, because we, the, the phenomena that, that, lead, that, although we can see gravity in everyday life, the phenomena where quantum gravity would become observationally relevant seems to be so far out of reach at the moment, experimentally out of reach. Well, thank you for that brief introduction to these, you know, I mean, obviously the book Atomland will go into a lot more detail, but making it, you know, clear for, for, for all of you, if you want to go off and, and, and get that, it's, it's definitely accessible for the public. This isn't a specialist uh, physics book okay. and, and, you know, can, can highly recommend that to, to all of you guys. So, John, quantum physics is often oversimplified for the public with a quite simple idea that we don't necessarily at quantum level have fixed reality and particles in particular places. It's seeing the world as probabilistic. So that there is a certain probability that certain things will be in certain places at certain times, which I believe are called superpositions. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously in stark juxtaposition to the manifest world we see out there that's very deterministic. So before we tell the main story today of this infamous and extraordinary wave particle duality discovered in the double slit experiment, which is sort of the main subject of our, of our chat today. Perhaps you could give us a little insight into the most, one of the most strange and fascinating acting conundrums in modern physics, the uncertainty principle, I believe sometimes called the observer effect. How was it discovered and what does it suggest for our deeper understanding of, of measurement of the physical world? Um, well, the first thing I say is I'm not, history of science is not my uh, strong point. <laughs> so I'm going to give you more of a, I don't know whether historically how it emerged exactly. I and mean, we, mm. we tend to tell ourselves myths about the, how the past, um, you know, we make everything neater in history than, than it actually was. I <laughs> exactly. But, but I can give, I mean, the list, the ideas that led to it from a physics point of view are clear. Um, and it's related to what I said about, about the electron being something different, actually. Um, it, it becomes, um, it, I guess it was Heisenberg was trying to build a picture, a mathematical picture to try and describe how electrons um, behave in, inside the atom. And was finding it very, people were finding it very difficult because classically, for instance, if you imagine an atom, you know, an atom is a heavy nucleus with um, electrons going around it in a classical picture. Uh, would be like the solar system, a mini version of the solar system, where you have electromagnetic attraction playing the role of gravity, but everything else looks pretty much the same. Mm. That doesn't work because if you um, if you have an electric charge going around in a circle, Maxwell's classical theory of electromagnetism tells you it will radiate light, it will radiate electromagnetic energy. Actually, in exactly the same way that gravitational rotation radiates gravitational waves. So if you think back to the discovery last couple of years of observation of gravitational waves from black holes going around each other, that's a very esoteric um, and, and stunning demonstration of what should be happening with atoms. Because if you've got two electric charges going around each other, they should be radiating electromagnetic waves. But that means that the, the electron would spiral into the atom. And exactly. Stable. The universe would not hold together. Atoms would not hold together. Yeah. So that's clearly wrong. Um, so that you have to immediately then jump the idea that the electron is just like a, um, a classical particle. Um, and then Bohr and people and de Broglie wheeled in the idea that, okay, well, what, what kind of things in nature are sort of stable um, and quantized? By quantized, I mean they can only take on certain discrete values, and when they do, they're very stable in those discrete values. And the answer is waves. The answer is resonances. If you think about yes, yes. Um, a, a string of a guitar vibrating, right, yeah. it can support certain frequencies, right, certain wavelengths. So there's the fundamental, there's the octave up, and so on. But the point is, 
a, a half integer number of wavelengths have to fit in the length of the string. Otherwise, that's not. Otherwise, there's no note. It dies away. But if right. you get it resonating, you have you know, you've got good sustain on your guitar, then it will live for a long time, right? Um, so is that that's the analogy that people reach for because they said, well, let's imagine these electrons have a um, they have to have a fixed number of wavelengths fitting into their orbit. And if they don't, then that's not an allowed orbit. And if they do, it's a very stable orbit. Right. And that, right. So people were struggling to put together some maths that would allow you to describe that because clearly it's not, you're talking about orbits, it's not just waves. On the other hand, they're not particle, like little planets. So there's some new maths needed, and Heisenberg was trying to put that together. And he built a whole matrix mechanics, basically, new, wielding some new math, relatively new mathematics, new to physics anyway, at the time to describe that and, and ended up just focusing on describing the measurements. And, and I find it very interesting that this whole deep idea about quantum mechanics being um, somewhat almost mystical sometimes, which is not a, not a good approach, but people do think of it like that. And it looks a bit weird. So even, you know, even in your business, people look at it like that sometimes. Yeah, we can tend to close our eyes to that bit of it sometimes, I think. But it's the, what's interesting is that it, that approach was driven really by being very workaday and pragmatic and saying, actually, I'm not going to worry about what's going on underneath. I'm just going to make sure I have the right predictive mathematics to describe observations. Okay? Right. Absolutely tied to observation. It's that Heisenberg said, I'm not going to worry about un- building some underlying mechanistic model. I'm going to say... What's the minimum mass I need to allow me allow me to describe atomic physics and do proper calculations and you know, do the stuff that, that theory is supposed to do, which is understand the universe in terms of predicting what it will do next? And when he put that mass together, it became obvious that um, you could describe all the observations that you could make, but there were some observations you could neither describe nor make, and and that comes back to the idea of you could not simultaneously observe. The, um, the the position and the and the momentum, the speed of an electron in this picture, for instance. But that's basically Heisenberg's uncertainty principle there, right there, okay? Brilliant. Because in, in, bed, embedded in his mathematical picture were, were certain was the fact that certain variables, certain observables, were what we call complementary observables, and and therefore gaining knowledge of one ga- um, degraded your knowledge of the other. Mm-hmm. And you can think of this as very pragmatic in terms of doing the experiment, but it's also then built into the mass of quantum mechanics as well. Okay. So let's get down to the nuts and bolts of today's conversation. Tell us about the double slit experiment and the wave particle paradox. What happened at first? I mean, it must have been an extraordinary moment uh, in physics in general. But what happened and why did it sort of explode so much controversy in modern physics? I think the, the idea... It, it's because it really, I think it was Feynman said, you know, if, if, you, if you can understand the double slit experiment, then that, the whole of quantum mechanics is somehow in there, right? If you, and, and in fact, arguably, aspects of it are not fully understood in a fully kind of epistemological way, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But, but mathematically, it's understood, and, and it leads directly to quantum field theory. So I should say, the whole paradigm we're talking about here, when people are talking about Schrodinger or Heisenberg or whatever, it's now encapsulated in what we call quantum field theory, in which particles, things like electrons, are, not, are neither classical particles nor waves. They're an object that we call a, they're an excitation in, in a quantum field, okay? Which is a bunch of words that actually are a label for the mathematical objects that describe this. So this is very closely tied to. Now, maths gives us a language that frees us from classical analogies and allows us to make predictions. Precisely. Yeah. And that's the language in which the standard model that I referred to earlier is, 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 is couched. So, and that's the language that actually derives directly from the double slit experiment. Right? So if you, if you want to understand the double slit experiment, you're inexorably driven to this language of quantum field theory. Absolutely. So what, what it's telling you is that, so if you ma- let's start with a classical double slit experiment. If you imagine a ripple tank with plain waves of water approaching two slits, okay? So the, the idea is you will see a, an interference pattern on a, coming out of that. So you will see regions. So you've got to imagine um, a wave coming from one slit and a wave coming from the other slit, and they travel to any given point in your ripple tank, in your water. Uh, and if um, 
if a, a peak of one wave coincides with the peak of the other, you get a double peak. Yeah. And if the peak coincides with the trough, you get a flat bit of undisturbed water. So there's a negative interference effect there. So yep. you get this, this pattern of, of still bits of water and bits that are going up and down very quickly. Okay. And that's because in some bits of your tank, peaks arrive together and troughs arrive together. And in other bits, they arrive, the peak arrives when a trough arrives and they cancel each other out. So that's a fundamentally wave-like phenomenon. And if you think back, there, there was a whole controversy about whether light was a wave or a particle as well, right? Right, uh, photons. And it's seen as an absolutely definitive experiment when you can do a diffraction grating or, or interference grating, double slit experiment with light. You see an interference pattern, therefore it's a wave. Stop messing about with that. <laughs> it's done. Right? <laughs> that was that was the controversy, I think, in the 19th century, if I remember. But that was that was I don't remember the 19th century, but I think if I remember uh, reading <laughs> about it, um, then uh, that that's seen as a definitive sign that you you're dealing with a wave, right? Because you see this interference type pattern. Yeah. What happened was that people did the same experiment with electrons, and we knew these electrons were particles because rather than a continuous wave, if you imagine a detector, the electrons going through the slits and hitting the detector, they come through, bing, bing, you know, they're, they're there. You see the little particles. It's not like... Discrete. Some, yeah, exactly. They're little discrete events. It's not some continual ripple tank of electrons. It's bing, like little bullets hitting the screen. However, if you get enough bullets, enough of these little electrons together, they will reproduce the same interference pattern that you see with the, with the waves, with the water waves. Right. And in fact, if you turn up the energy of your lights, if you get a very, very high-powered like X-ray laser or something, then you stop seeing the ripple tank thing. You start seeing little pings of light as well, little photons, we call them. They look like particles, even though the pattern they build up over time is exactly the ripple wave pattern. So this is the, you know, that in a nutshell, that's, this is weird. These are not particles because they interfere. But these are not waves because they're going bing in little bullets, like little bullets. So they're clearly something else, right? They're, they're exhibiting in the same experiment, with it, particularly with the electron, which is the first time this was shown. You're seeing explicitly the particle nature of the electron in, in its arrival, discrete arrival at the, at the detector. But, you see, but over time, you see it has this wave-like property as well at the right. And this kicked off a big debate amongst... Um uh, who would have been your colleagues back in the day, um, and presumably quite a few different points of view and different ways of explaining this came yeah. into existence. And that sort of led to some of the early main theories of quantum mechanics, if I understood correctly, one of which I think is called the Copenhagen interpretation. Is that right? Niels Bohr and, and Heisenberg. And then later on, there were some, some other ones, including the many worlds. Could you give us a quick introduction to the sort of the main strongest interpretations of that phenomenon? Okay, but I, I think first you also need to be careful about the distinction between um, what kinds of theories. So those are interpretations of theories. Right. So the, the, I, would, I would like to draw a distinction between the theory and the interpretation of the theory. Okay? Very, very so, important distinction. So... Yeah. The double, in terms of theory, the double state experiment is understood. And probably the most intuitive way, as, as often doing that, is, is Feynman's um, approach, where he talks about path integrals. So he, he imagines um, the electron essentially following all possible paths and um, carrying with it a wave like a little dial, a wave like property. And then you get, and so the electrons remain sort of discrete things, probabilistically following all paths, and, and the interference pattern is preserved because all these different paths interfere, like the waves interfere. They carry with them a little um, phase, we call it. Ah. They arrive in phase, they, they amplify, and if they arrive out of phase, they cancel, and that reproduces the wave-like property. There's a brilliant book, just Feynman's book, QED, which is... Um, aimed at the general public. I think it's quite an ambitious um, <laughs> book. It's very short, though. You've got and to start he, somewhere. Yeah, and he gives a really nice, intuitive picture of this. And it's, you know, this is the theory that works. This explains why glass is transparent. It reflect, explains why, mir why mirrors reflect. It explains why atoms are stable and how they interact. It's, it's an amazing theory, right? And it works. So from that point of view, there's no real controversy, right? That's, that's done, bang, bang. That's sorted from a... And what, what, is that, what is that known as, that theory of Feynman's it's theory? It's quantum electrodynamics. So it's embedded in the standard model that I referred to earlier. It's the, it's the theory of... It's the quantum field theory of electromagnetism. 
Right. And you put that with the other two fundamental forces of the standard model, that is the standard model, basically. I see. Um, so that, in terms of, a, and this is many of my colleagues would take point of view, from a point of view of, of practical physics and doing observational science, that's the theory and it's understood. Hmm. Okay. However, it begs a whole bunch of questions about who decides which, or how, how does the electron decide which path it, it went? Did it actually go down one path? What does it mean to say the electron goes down all these paths at the same time? Um, if there's just one electron, how's it doing that? That leads you very quickly into thinking, well, maybe there are many worlds and it goes down every, it, it, in every world, it goes down a definite path. But what we see is a sum of all the worlds and that's the many worlds type interpretation. Right. That it's coming in there. Um, and, uh, or, or the, the Copenhagen principle one, which is the one I, I I kind of lean towards just because it's kind of brutal. Um, it just says it doesn't make any sense to ask any question which you can't answer experimentally. That's the way I would um, pose it. So it kind of throws all the, all the questions about hidden variables and underlying dynamics away and says there are none. I, I You're joking. It, it actually concludes there are none. Yeah, it says that and anything you can't address experimentally is not real, so don't, don't talk about it. <laughs> but does it genuinely believe it's not real, even though we can see it as a phenomenon? Or is no, it just can't. saying it's convenient, <laughs> it's more convenient not to think about it because experimentally we've only got this, this, this data to deal with? It, but what it does is says that these mathematical pictures that we build that are very predictive of the probabilities. Um, so remember, these, this Feynman picture, for instance, QED, can can predict very, very precisely the pattern you'll see on the screen, but it can't predict electron by electron where a given electron will go. Right. And only can do that probabilistically. So to buy, the co to buy either, either of these interpretations, you have to cope with that randomness somehow. Okay? Exactly, exactly. And, and uh, the Copenhagen interpretation will basically say it's an intrinsic randomness in nature. I think that, that, that there is no... There's no hidden mechanism. It's not, there's no way in principle of predicting where this electron goes. It's just not possible to know any information that would determine a particular electron. You can only do it over, over, a, um, over an ensemble. And you can only predict the overall distribution. And obviously you're an experimental physicist. You're used yeah. to dealing with real data for observable phenomena. But as a thinker, as a human, um, doesn't that leave you unsatisfied? Doesn't it make you feel that there's a stone somewhere that hasn't been unturned? Yeah, it makes been think that, yeah. It, it, I mean, on the one hand, you've got to retain a certain amount of humility. Nature is what it is, and the fact that it seems weird to us doesn't mean it's not the way it is. So, you know. Precisely, precisely. Um, and, and there's, a yeah. certain, there's a certain humility in saying, well, listen, we just really don't have the tools to, to understand something like that yet. And I suppose we must remain open to the possibility that, you know, we might, it might occur to us how to, to do this. Yeah. But, but, I mean, one of the things I find absolutely brilliant about physics is the whole idea of, of what I discussed briefly with quantum field theory. It's very counterintuitive, very non-trivial totally driven by us just looking at nature more and more carefully. We'd never have invented quantum field theory just because it was nice, because it's not especially nice. <laughs> but we, it, it's, it's a huge intellectual achievement, but it's completely driven by, make, by trying to explain the way nature actually is, not yeah. by thinking about how we'd like it to be. Exactly. You know I mean? And that's the thing, isn't it? With classical mechanics, we, we, we're we just looking for a nice, clean uh, explanation. At some level, although the ideas of what, what's clean have also changed, right? So Maxwell, when he wrote, Maxwell, uh, James Clark Maxwell wrote down the first kind of unified theory of electricity and magnetism and light, basically. It's an amazing um, thing, kind of late 20th century. Um, he didn't like the idea of waves, of fields, this idea of an electromagnetic field. He didn't like and he, he was trying to draw at one point little pictures of, of cogs and wheels and things, mechanical. <laughs> but to him, that was more natural. To us now, it looks completely unnatural. You think that's completely contrived. And in fact, even though he died young, he changed his mind before he died. He looked at Michael Faraday's picture of field lines and said, no, that's what it is. That's the way to go. And it's mm. weird, though, because Maxwell had already written down the maths for all that. Faraday had the intuition about fields. And Maxwell, at some point, was trying to say, 
here's my maths, which perfectly <laughs> describes these fields, but it's got to have an underlying variable of cogs and wheels and mechan- mechanical physics. You know, I guess the Industrial Revolution and things, people wanted everything to be mechanistic in that way. And, uh, and Faraday was the one who said, who took the field lines and things seriously. And, and actually, that's what Maxwell's equations describe. But Faraday probably didn't have the maths to deal with these equations at first, mm. but had the intuition before Maxwell did. Even. So, so anyway, that, it, it, so that our idea, you know, that quantum field theory is the equivalent now of Maxwell's equations. And the idea that, that we might be looking for hidden variables in it may be as daft as looking for little cogs and wheels, you know? It's, right. It's not, it doesn't have to be that way. It's that we, there's no harm speculating and trying to find out ways of testing our speculations. That's what science is. But we should be humble and bear in mind that it might be that our expectations will never be met. There's also this completely bonkers many worlds interpretation, which I just wanted to touch on. I think we're going to do a show on it completely. No, have, you told, have you told Sean Carroll it's completely bonkers? Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I did approach Sean, and Sean is, is very busy with his own his own podcast at the moment. And uh, yeah. I mean, I, I do love his absolute conviction for this, and it's great you know, hearing other people like Tagmark as well, taking it even further into the world of a sort of a purely mathematical uh, many worlds theory. Give us a very little idea about what this, this quite extraordinary alternative to the Copenhagen interpretation is. is okay, about. well, for, first of all, I think you, you said in one breath that you like the humility and then in the other breath you like the evangelicalism of, of Carol and people on their... On well, the I think it's world. ambitious. I think it's <laughs> ambitious. But, but, but yeah, okay, when you say evangelical, I think that's, that sort of zealot approach is really about conviction and excitement about new theories. And, you know, I can sure. forgive a little bit of overzealousness if they're coming up with ideas that could actually pull us in a, in a new conceptual direction. But... Yeah, yeah, you feel I, that you feel that it's a bit evangelical, do you? I well, no. I, 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 well, maybe I, tell us what it's about first, and then we could speak about how yeah, nuts okay, it is sure. to believe it. I mean, I guess, I guess my point is, I like I like to draw the distinction between. I, I, I worry about spurious authority being given to things. So when I say the Higgs boson exists, I mean a certain level of scientific certainty. If I was to say many worlds interpretation is correct, that's a diff- completely different level that's not the same kind of scientific statement right so right it's yeah i think i think we should maintain some distance but you're right we're people we've got to get enthusiastic about things occasionally um <laughs> so, so the, I, my understanding of this stuff is that and, and this is the fundamental problem that, I, that bothers me and which i think is an unsolved problem is that is that the copenhagen interpretation divides the universe into the observer and the observed and that's quite difficult because physics is seeking to describe the whole universe in a coherent picture, right? And that includes the observer and the observed. So the Copenhagen interpretation has this idea of suddenly a wave function collapse that you, you I mean, this is what Schrodinger was, was inventing his cat to try and show how ridiculous it was, I believe, actually. Um, that, you, you, know, you think he was trying to make us laugh with that, that image? Well, I think he was trying. It was it was supposed to be a reducto ad absurdum on the whole idea, which, given that Schrödinger came up with the idea, is kind of interesting. He, I mean, he was highlighting the issue. I think. John, do you think you, like, you could very quickly explain that? Just, just yeah, I mean, the idea is that that you Schrödinger's cat. So the, the the two. So think of the two slit experiment to start with. We'll get to the cat in a minute. But <laughs> in the two slit experiment. Um, <coughs> The, the result in pattern that you see on the screen of electrons going through these slits is, is decided at the point that they hit the screen. Right. Okay? So ask, if you ask at any point in between which slit did they go through, you destroy the pattern. You, you don't have, you, you've, you've intervened in the system and you've destroyed what we call this coherence between the, the paths, of, the possible paths of the electron. So, the, so it's like the electron is potentially going down any of these paths and it only makes its mind up when it hits the screen. And what does it mean? It makes its mind up. That you know, what, what, the electron will be saying they're conscious. No, we're not. So what we're saying is that somehow it, they've interfered with a classical system, which is the screen, and we've measured them on that. And the, the cat is the same kind of idea. You set up a a, um, a quantum system, which can be you typically is a is an atomic decay, a nuclear decay, which is a fundamentally random quantum event, and you you poison the cat depending on whether this, the nucleus decays or not. Right. Um, so the idea is that the the cat then is in a is is like the electron in between the slits and the screen. It's in an indeterminate state. 
It could and be dead or it could be alive. It could be dead or alive and because the atom itself was um, was in an indeterminate state. It could have decayed or it's not. And at the moment, I haven't observed it. And the idea is you open the box and see whether the cat is dead or alive. And at that point, it's like the electron hit the screen. You've decided one of the random uh, things. Okay? It's very counterintuitive, isn't it? It's right. Well, I mean, it's nonsense, actually, because <laughs> we know that in order to poison the cat, the atom would have had to interfere with, would have had to interact with the classical system already. So you're not the first classical system. The cat is a classical system. So we know that the, the idea of a cat being in a coherent superposition of dead and alive doesn't work because we know that coherence kind of breaks down. That's not, that wasn't known in Schrodinger's time. It's not completely trivially understood now, but there's definitely this feeling that, that there's definitely an understanding that, um, that it's difficult to keep large systems coherent, that this, this delicate um, maintenance of all the possibilities at once actually breaks down very quickly as soon as you kind of thermalize it, as soon as you involve any kind of other randomness from outside. Okay, right. you yeah. break that down. And so any interaction with the kind of the rest of the universe makes a decision for the electron, okay? Mm. So, um, or makes a decision for the cat. And in fact, the cat counts as part of the classical universe, so that doesn't work. Um, nevertheless, yeah. the conceptual idea is still a problem because what do we mean by um, the classical universe? You can say, well, okay, it's an ensemble of, of particles above a certain number, it gives you a kind of more or less coherently incoherent um, noise, which will break the coherence of the system. You can describe that mathematically, but you're still having to, at some point, break that code, you still have the wave function collapse. All we're arguing about here is where it happens. We've still got the problem that, that a, 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 classic, a, a quantum mechanical coherent system becomes incoherent and decides on one of the multiple possibilities is resolved into a actuality at some point. So it, so seem, it seems to become deterministic only as it is observed. This is the big problem, isn't it? Yeah. And all you... argued, yeah. So all I just argued about is where the point of observation is, whether it's at the, whether the cat can be an observer or whether the actual vial of poison is, is a classical observer, in fact, because you can say it's, it's not really to do with observing as a conscious being, it's to do with it interacting with some bigger system that, we, that is described classically. I but where's see. that dividing line? You know, where, where, why is, uh, why, when, what happens when a quantum system becomes classical? Well, and if it's purely classical, if it's purely physical, why would that phenomena occur? It's, it does leave that question unanswered, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly, yeah. And the many worlds approach, as I understand it, is the way of trying to get around that. It's trying to say that actually all classical possibilities are result, uh, 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 take place as well. So not only do we have the electron potentially going through all slits in our experiment, we also have the electron arriving at all points on the screen, even if you only have one electron. So... The, the pattern that's built up over thousands of electrons that we see in our world um, actually exists in an equal number of worlds, or, or even more worlds, where each individual electron will have gone to every single point on the screen. And we're um, not talking about potential worlds here, are we? We're talking about actual alternate worlds. That, yeah, I mean, I, I, to be honest, that's the difference that I see between the Copenhagen and the, and the many world principle, actually. I mean, the, I mean, in the Copenhagen principle, you can sort of, Copenhagen interpretation, sorry, you can uh, sort of to treat all these worlds as, as at the classical, at the quantum level, you can behave, they're just the same. They behave as uh, the many worlds or there's many possibilities in the Copenhagen interpretation, and they basically play the same role. The difference is that at the point of interaction, the classical realisation of, of one of the alternatives actually happening, in the Copenhagen interpretation, there's some mysterious wave function collapse that decides that. In the many worlds one, it happens, um, it, it, all possibilities do happen classically as well, but they all happen in separate worlds. And we, and are, just, we only are living one of them. Well, yeah, then you, you just shut the, the problem one down and how do I decide which world I'm going to live in? <laughs> and and, and I, you know, basically it means you and I are bifurcating all the time as well and um, the, my perceived consciousness is following one path through this and presumably I have other perceived consciousnesses which are following other paths through it as well. 
It certainly uh, does I, open I, up I, a bag of worms. There's no yeah. doubt that it opens up a bag of worms. But it isn't much less satisfactory than the Copenhagen, Copenhagen interpretation that, that sort of leaves that door open as well. And even von Neumann and, and Wigner's idea of the collapsing of the wave function so in order to, to us to have a deterministic reality, again, doesn't answer the question, why does that wave function collapse? So... Just before we kind of talk about the implications of that, because I'm sure that you have some ideas about it, even though I understand completely that experimental physicists have to be careful about what kind of implications they might be drawing and, and potentially signing up to as a philosophical position. But before we get to that, you know, you gave a beautiful talk at the Royal Institution, which is on YouTube, and I can highly recommend to all of the listeners. Um, and in there, you were speaking about the wave uh, particle duality. And you said a comment that I'd never heard from a physicist before. You said um, that it appears to, be, to, to behave like a wave, it appears to behave like a particle, but it isn't really either one. Yeah. Now, obviously, that just opens up a world of uncertainty. Can you at least try and speculate what kind of thing you think it might be? I can, do, I can do more than speculate. I mean, I can tell you exactly what it is, but it's only in a mathematical language. So it's, it's a, I think I, I said earlier, it's an excitation in the quantum field. That's what it is. Um, which we have a, a consistent, a coherent mathematical picture to describe. It's a, a chunk, it's a bit of motion if, and, and, and a bit of energy carrying with it certain quantum numbers like electric charge, for instance, or right. this kind of thing. Um, I think it's probably better to... You see, we have in, in your hidden in the idea that it ought to be a wave or a particle um, is a kind of implicit, commonsensical understanding of what waves and particles are, and exactly that that bears some unpacking, right? I mean, what we're saying when we talk about what is a particle, we're saying it's a, a localized bunch of stuff, basically a localized bit of actually energy, because we know that energy and mass are equivalent, so it's actually a localized blob of energy. So um, can it, can this, sorry, just to, to take a little sidestep here, because this is a very common conception amongst the general public that we're heading towards a kind of matter is in fact energy understanding. How true is that? Just to get a sense true. of the implications. It, it is true. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm not <laughs> being, so I'm not being a crazy hippie by saying matter is energy. No, no, they're, they're, there's a constant between them, which is the speed of light squared, and that's it. E equals mc squared. It's not a hippie equation. It's good. 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 <laughs> just, just for the, just for the, uh, the skeptics out there who uh, yeah. look, look at but, me with a raised the, the eyebrow. Is, it's a form of energy, right? So it's a different. It can be converted to and from energy, and it's kind of like energy gets locked in a localized state with a particular. As I mentioned, quantum numbers before, so it can have a certain angular momentum, a certain position, a certain electric charge, or or um, other properties like that. Wow. Um, and so that, matter, that's, matter is an excitation. And, and nothing else. That is uh, brilliant to hear from the mouth of a professional because I didn't feel qualified to make those kind of statements until today. No, but I mean, uh, that's true. And it's, it's not a vague, woolly concept. It's a very specific concept within a quantum field theory that that's what we mean. And it, and it obeys very, very definite laws. And those are the laws that are um, dictated in order to explain observation. Okay? So that's where they come from. Um, it's true that it's probabilistic at some level. We still have this inherent randomness, but but on on in an ensemble, it's completely predictive. So I talked a little bit. I mean, we, I was just trying to unpack what we mean by wave and particle, and I, I got as far as particle, which is basically a little localized clump of energy in the form of mass. A wave is similarly not, and we we think, oh yeah, common sense, we know what a wave is, but it's not that obvious, right? I mean, it's it has a it, a wave, we, we often think of it as implying a medium, so like waves in water or sound waves in, in, the, in air, they're pressure waves. So a bit, of, a bit of air gets compressed and then it wants to expand and that pushes, that compresses the neighbouring bit of air and so on. And, and we have this kind of compression wave moving through the atmosphere, through the air. That's a pretty nebulous, I mean, you can describe it again mathematically, but it's not that commonsensical when you think about it. And it gets even worse when you start thinking about what is electromagnetism, because an electromagnetic field is a very insubstantial thing. It's not matter. It's not, it's not a motion of molecules in air or of molecules in a water wave. It's, what is it? It's an electromagnetic field. What, what, so what's that when it's at home? People invented a luminiferous ether to carry electromagnetic waves, but it's not there. 
and relativity yeah. gets rid of the need for it. And Maxwell's equations describe a wave without really giving any substance to what the wave is waving. Exactly. Right. So, so our, our classical ideas that we think are common sense, well, you know, this is obvious what a particle and a wave is, they're not at all obvious, really. They're just things we got used to because we see them a lot. And do you and think I, this quantum observation of the excitation in the quantum field that you're talking about, do you think that gives us a better understanding of either one or the other? I mean, perhaps we're actually talking, I, because these are fundamental to the physical world we're observing in terms of waves and particles, presumably this is the real wave and particle. And in fact, we should, yeah. be, we should be focusing on that as a way of talking uh, uh, about the world. Absolutely. And, and what we observe as classical waves and particles are emergent behavior that is derived from this fundamental, um, the fundamental objects, which are the quantum fields of the standard model. Yeah, so that precisely. And, and we're, so we're, we're kind of approaching things backwards because that's where we live. We live in the classical world. Right. And we're, we're, we're looking at presumably what are classical limits of an underlying theory. Um, and we can see how, the, we, we know very well now how the classical world we see emerges from the quantum field theory world of the standard model, we can, we can predict that and calculate a lot of that. Well, and that's actually something I wanted to, to touch on quickly. Um, coming back to good old Sean Carroll, this is something I really agree with him on. He, he's currently arguing that the traditional way of making assumptions about the classical model and then quantizing down to the submolecular level is working in the wrong direction and nature doesn't work like that. He argues that nature is quantum from the start and therefore we should be calculating up from the quantum level to understand the emergence of space-time you know, in this excitation that you've been describing. But, but do you buy that? I mean, that's pretty logical, but it causes a lot of problems for experimentation in the, in the deterministic world, doesn't it? Um, I, I pretty much do buy that. Um, I think... Uh, can we do it, though, or is he, just, is he just dreaming that we can actually... Well, we, we can do a lot. So, I mean, uh, it depends on what level he's talking. So certainly you can go from the standard model and rather precisely, very precisely, predict the behaviour of photons and electrons. You can qualitatively, and in some cases very precisely, predict the behavior of quarks and, and therefore neutrons and protons. And, and so you can build up the periodic table, you can build up therefore chemistry and biology, basically from the beginning, um, from the first principles. I guess what Sean's talking about also is, is can we build up, I mean, talking about space and time, and he's coming from it from a cosmological angle as well, I guess. And as I mentioned, gravity um, and space and time are not really incorporated in the standard model. So right. space and time are really the stage on which the standard model plays. And, and again, we've got a separation then between the objects we're describing in the standard model and the, and the kind of background in which they move. And physics but the, like but the theory, the theory, the, um, the theory of relativity and the way it's talking about the bending of space time yeah presumably does provide a bit of a problem for that in terms of us yeah. actually being able to constrict these excitations that we're observing in a classical understanding of space and time. Um, so that eventually will need to be reconciled, I imagine, and, and presumably I, I think quite problematically. Right. Yeah, I mean, without having seen the specific statements from Sean Carroll that you're talking about, I think that's what he's probably getting at, is that we should not be thinking of implicitly, which is probably the way most particle physics physicists think not you know they would subconsciously this is what we're thinking of with the operating assumption which is we have our quantum objects but they're moving in a, a relativistic space time which is classical yes which curved and, and blah, blah 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 but we're not quantizing the space and time in general so that is a big assumption yeah and that the, yeah and that's it that works uh, the energies of the large hadron collider that still works so we haven't been forced to abandon it yet but if you want to try and understand cosmology from the first few moments of the universe or you want to um, try and understand physics today at even higher energies you're probably going to have to abandon those assumptions and i think right. that's what we're getting at um, and uh, i i think it's true to say that the, the the kind of string theory type approach to to try and address those issues and incorporate gravity and it's still to a very large extent dealing with classical space-time. And there seems to be a lot of interest on trying to, I, I, yeah, build up, start with the, quantum, the mathematics of the of this sort of quantum field theory type mathematics and try and see if space and time emerge from that in the same way that chemistry emerges from that. Well, John, um, when, you, when you were just saying, you know, describing what it is instead of being a particle and, uh, or, or a, a waveform, 
it is in fact this excitation in the quantum field you mentioned but it's it's only understandable in mathematical terms i mean what do you think of this guy max tedmark who is um also a many worlds he's now coming up with this even more ambitious form of many worlds where he's basically saying it's all maths there is yeah, nothing yeah. else i mean it kind of does lead us in that direction if we're saying really we can only describe this mathematically as soon as we start thinking in terms of time or space or, or matter or wavelengths or particles we're immediately shot in the foot before we've even kind of made a step in the right direction do you think he's onto something with this thing of just saying well actually sod it all there is is maths uh honestly no i don't um <laughs> he's onto something so I that's soulless <laughs> That's just an opinion, right? I mean, it's just my opinion. I, I don't. I mean, they, they, we don't really know. And I'd like to come back to this idea that. Um, sorry, I got a big Lebowski quote in there. Damn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, um, it's. I'm. Uh, it's a matter of where we, where it's leading us. A lot of this stuff, I suspect, most of these ideas are leading us nowhere. Okay. And the thing that's actually led us places is observing stuff and struggling to grapple with it. And that's led us out of our comfort zone. That's led us into counterintuitive ideas about the universe, which in the end turn out to be correct. Okay? Mm -hmm. By correct, I mean they allow us to understand more using less. Okay? And allow us to predict more using less. I'm not, however, I'm not trying to um, dis... dis Max Tegmark or anyone else coming up with these Well, ideas. he's very honest about it that it's completely absurd. I think he's trying to make a point. I think he's trying to... And I to think that's that. very valuable. This is a very important... So I've been focusing on the kind of incremental, pragmatic approach to science. I think equally important is the fact that we speculate as humans and we cast our net widely and we try and think ourselves out from our little box of where we've managed to get to with experiments and say, well, but what if... And do a thought experiment over here. Right. And some of that things... That's great, but we should acknowledge it for what it is. It's speculation. Until it connects back to where we are, it's still just speculation. And maths is a great guide, but you know you can overdo the maths at some point as well. Um, well that's the last thing. Before I move on to the next question, I wanted to just quickly see. Uh, I mean, like I said, it, it, it's very difficult for experimental physicists to make a massive... Um, Basically, in taking implications from things that, like you say, we have no idea. It's pure speculation. But if you had to speculate, and I imagine you must on a daily basis, where has it brought you to as a person? And I don't mean as a physicist. I mean just as a human in terms of the way you see the world. Um, it's an interesting way of putting the question. I, I think... Um it I, I, this is, I think I'm, I'm still quite close to the Copenhagen type interpretation. Uh, I still have this issue with... So, I'm, very, I'm quite content um, with the idea that the fundamental objects of the universe may be things that we don't intuitively understand in a commonsensical way, because I don't see any reason why our brains should have been designed to do that. Our brains have evolved to understand the classical world that we need to understand to survive. So it doesn't bother me terribly that... Um, what we learn about subatomic physics doesn't actually fit neatly any of those ideals. I'm quite happy with the idea that the, a quantum field is a fundamentally new object for which there's no good analogy in, in everyday life, but we've got quite a good handle on it through maths because maths is brilliant and we invented maths or we discovered maths or whatever. Um, good old Pythagoras. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite content with that idea. What I'm not content with is the division of the world into observer and observed, and that bothers me. And then I, and, and I think that I am part of the physical universe. What I talk about as me um, is part of the physical universe, and I, I still have, a, have an issue with any description of physics that imposes a divide between the observed system and the observing system. Because in the end, and I guess you know, this, this is what Cosmo... I, I do think about we, we're living basically in, in what should be the wave function of the universe, the whole universe essentially. Which was Einstein's solution. And this brings me beautifully on to what I wanted to ask next, unless you had something to add there, John. No, that's fine. No. Because this has troubled physicists since the beginning, hasn't it? And I just wanted to draw your attention to a few things um, which really I find very, very interesting. This is a certain important names in quantum theory, particularly Planck, more recently Wheeler, even Schrodinger. They're all quoted to have said that they believed consciousness to be fundamental in the observation of matter and that they 
you know, could not be separated in that sense, that they, they, they just couldn't get around this problem. So let me just read you a couple of these quotes, because I think the public will like them as well. I think the listeners will enjoy this. So Schrodinger uh, uh, in 1984, consciousness cannot be accounted for in physical terms. For consciousness is absolutely fundamental. It cannot be accounted for in terms of anything else. John Wheeler, 1990, all matter and all things are physical and information theoretic in origin. And this is a participatory universe, similar to what you were saying there about this problem of separation. Max Planck, 1933, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as a derivative of consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing postulates consciousness. And for me, perhaps the most cogent of all, Max Planck in 1931 and again in 1944, as a man who's devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about atoms this much, there is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particle of the atom into vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume behind this force the existence of consciousness, of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. So from my point of view, these profound observations formed after years in the laboratory watching these things, watching these particles pinging around, um, from these great, great physicists who are still revered today, seems to confirm the implications of the double slit, um, but mainstream physics doesn't agree. Like, why don't more physicists come out with these kind of statements? I think, I think the only one... I think they, don't, they fundamentally don't solve anything. They're, oh, they're, no, good. They're, certainly doesn't solve anything. But I think that's what was troubling them. That's what was troubling them. I think they're mostly regarded as uninteresting by, by physicists. I think because they're not testable, they have no implications, basically, um, for, for physics. To, to the observed so, world, yeah. I think the exception is John Wheeler's. I think the idea that, you know, he said all matter and all things physical are information theoretic in origin. I can, so again, this is just my opinion now, but I, I, I don't like, see, Max Planck is talking about, he's struggling with this idea of matter being a substance that in some intuitive classical sense, which I don't think he's really engaged with there. I mean, but, but the way I would put it, which I think is in some sympathy with Wheeler's approach, is that what the participatory universe i think is a very powerful idea i think things are only in, in, this is again this is in my head but i think it's actually operationally the way we deal with it in physics as well things are defined by their properties okay and we and their properties are actually just how they interact with other things and that gets you to the, actually we're talking about what's real is relationships between things because you can't actually define a, any anything thing in the broadest sense you can't define it in isolation you can only say that under certain circumstances this is how it will behave and this is how it will behave and so on and that applies to to the whole physical universe and arguably to consciousness as well actually. absolutely so, but I mean, doesn't that view, from my point of view consciousness is probably a physical a, a property of the physical universe as well um, and it's defined by its interaction by, with other physical properties of the universe. And it, in the same way that an electron is defined by its interactions with light and with other electrons and with gravity and so on. And um, the idea that there's, there's a, re a reality behind that framework of mutual interactions strikes me as unnecessary and not actually helpful. Yeah. What's, what's, and, and that, again, this is, very, this is a development, I think, of the Copenhagen interpretation, actually. Because right. that is saying what's real is what I can measure. And I think if you, if you extend that and say, well, it's, not, it's not to do with how smart your experiment is, it's to do with what are the properties of a given thing. How do you define a property? You only define it by its interactions with other things. That's basically the idea of measurement at some level. But it, does, it doesn't place. get around the, the concern you just stated before, <coughs> before I was reading those quotes. You, you were basically saying the same concern as these guys have with the Copenhagen interpretation, which is that we never really get away from the fact that 
it appears that there is this strange uh, connection between the observer and the observer, but yet they can't be reconciled. Well, um, I mean, Einstein, it, it, Einstein had quite a good way of getting around this problem, right? He was, he, he was talking about the fact that the entire universe, including our consciousness and the observer's consciousness, had a waveform of its own. Yeah. Do you think that goes some way to get around this, this very frustrating problem? Doesn't, no, it doesn't do anything for me, <laughs> so, so not really. I mean, I, I think that I think the, the, the quote, the Schrodinger and Planck quotes you gave basically give up on consciousness. They give it a special status uh, in, in, as an unphysical thing, and that is, a, in a way, it's a way around the problem because then you give observation by a conscious being some special physical status by implication. Mm. The Wheeler quote, I think, is trying to make consciousness part of the physical universe they are more interdependent they're working yeah. together to form yeah. some kind of and it's not that the consciousness is not real and it's not that it's not a special remarkable phenomenon but it's a physical phenomenon like everything else and it's participating in the universe like everything else is and i guess uh, there's uh, this idea I'm, I'm not really sure what einstein meant by a wave function of the universe i must admit i wouldn't use the word wave function now i don't think we would yeah um, in general but i think the idea that yes there's a the universe is a coherent physical system that contains both its space and its time and its matter and energy content and contains consciousness as well. That's what we're striving to understand, the whole thing together. We're not, we don't want to kind of put consciousness off in some mystical box. We certainly don't want to have space and time separate from the quantum mechanical reality, which unfortunately is where we are at the moment. Um, and, well, it's and got I to emerge out of it somehow, hasn't it? That's what we'd hope, right? Uh, again, just I, I guess we should finish in a minute, but we yeah, we, uh, just I've just got and, one more. Finish on a, 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 get close close to the end, then on a note of humility, there that this is us wanting to impose our ideas on the universe, and that's the wrong way around. We Indeed. should be looking at the universe and trying to make sense of it. And that is the sign of a good scientist, isn't it? And it's, it's just not so often not the way because we're so keen on proving our own ideas. <laughs> so listen, yeah, John, I appreciate... That drive, is, that drive is an important part of science, but we've always got to do the reality check and remember... Yeah, and we've got to be humble and understand that obviously our ideas are, are, are hopelessly incomplete. Okay, so last thing, John, I, I, I know we're coming up to the hour now. Mm -hmm. um, entanglement. Could this concept of entanglement help to explain the seemingly instricable connected nature of matter and the observer in what Planck suggested was a kind of mind-matter matrix and what Einstein theorized eventually we could understand as a sort of unified wave function of the, the universe, even if that's not the way we describe it today? The news was just absolutely full of this entanglement stuff in 2019. A university, the University of Glasgow team managed to capture some kind of image of it. And then a team in Bristol succeeded in what they're calling, I don't like this word because I think it's, it's, it's misleading, but they're calling it teleportation of information from one computer chip to another absolutely instantaneously with no delay. And then probably most strikingly, um, the University of Science and Technology in China have set a new record for the distance through which they were teleporting entangled photons over yeah. 1,200 kilometers to the world's first quantum communication satellite. Yeah. What exactly is this phenomenon of entanglement? Because it was discovered right back at the beginning, wasn't it? Um, we, we've already, actually, it's not that different. We've already discussed it. Ah. Because it, what it is, is large-scale coherent quantum systems. Okay, that's sort of words. But what it is, is keeping the, um, the indeterminate state, if you like, of, of, say, a couple of electrons going through a two-slit thing. And we're talking about that the, they're in a coherent state until they hit the classical system, okay? It's, and so you could say that there's an entanglement there between the electron being here or here. Or, or there's an entanglement. There are two, two possible states of two things which are entangled with each other, meaning that they're both mutually unresolved. And this is called spin, is that right? There's, there's an element of... That's one way of doing it. So the, these experiments you're talking about, yes, what they're doing is we say there's a correlation between the spins of the objects and both of them are, are individually indeterminate, but once you determine one, you also impact the other and, and that's how it, it works. So, um, it's a generalization of, of this quantum... It, it's, 
I think this research is really exciting. There's a lot of nonsense thoughts about it in terms of, I, I agree with you that teleportation is probably not a very helpful buzzword for it, but, but what's really interesting about it and, and which touches on the fundamentals of quantum mechanics as well as possible many practical applications is the ability to construct and control and preserve large-scale quantum systems. So systems which have a quantum coherence over a very long distance a macroscopic distance, but yet have the properties of subatomic physics in that they're fundamentally quantum mechanical. That's that's the exciting physics in this, because there are theories that say, you know, that actually, for instance, the curvature of space-time breaks quantum entanglement, and you can start constraining those theories, you know, because we don't understand gravity apart from classically. You can say maybe maybe there's a fundamental limitation on how far in space-time you can maintain quantum coherence. Well, these Chinese experiments have set a limit on that now because they've managed to do the biggest, what, the, the largest quantum coherence system ever. There are also you know, people working on, on, a lot of them will dress it up as working on quantum computing, and indeed it might help with quantum computing. But maintaining a, a, a processor with multiple processing um, bits, um, uh, qubits or whatever, in a, in a coher- coherent system over a long periods of time. Could be problematic. Fundam- yeah, it's very hard to do, but it's also touching off fundamental physics. There may be fundamental physics limitations as to how big you can do that, not just operational ones, um, but actual, we may be learning something about how wave functions do collapse, if you want to put it that way. Well, that's, that's I think, why I was interested to at least touch on it. We're going to do a whole show on entanglement, listeners, so don't worry uh, that we're just touching on this at the end. It is, I think, something that really needs to be talked about. Quite interestingly as well, because for one, uh, again, we're finding technology being developed before we actually really have a theory of how it works. And I always find that very interesting. When when there isn't a theory, but technology starts going for it, that's when... I think, I think, that, was, I think that was true of the steam engine as well, by the way. I think... Yeah. A lot of the dynamics was derived from looking at steam engines rather than the other way around. Right. And I think this is when um, our sort of... Um I was going to say our pride and our arrogance uh, as, as, as scientific thinkers uh, is that we will not accept something to be true until we have a theory. And I can understand that and I respect that. But, you know, I prefer your practical attitude. Which says, Look, we can observe this. We may not understand it yet. Let's be humble. Okay, let's go off and make stuff with it. It's brilliant. It can solve a lot of our problems and we'll come back to, to working the theory and probably it'll, we'll understand better um, okay. once we see it in action. Um, so... John, I won't push you anymore on, the, on that last subject. So just to close, um, Einstein called this spooky action at a distance, famously dismissing it as some sort of woo-woo thing. Was he saying it didn't exist? Doesn't this amazing technological application and these ridiculous distances the Chinese are reporting, I mean, doesn't this completely change the playing field for understanding non-local phenomena and, and classical causation? Yeah, I mean, I think Einstein would have been surprised and possibly dismayed by the results of, say, the aspect experiments where you really see this actually happening. And my understanding so now is that the Bell inequalities and the aspect experiments and things completely rule out um, local hidden variables. So you can choose now. You can either have um, hidden variables in quantum mechanics which make it Predict, uh, which remove the random element, but they have to be non-local variables. So they have, uh, or you have something more like the Copenhagen approach, where there are no hidden variables. Um, so would you would you come out with a statement and say this is spooky action at a distance, or would you be a little bit more open? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I'd call it spooky. It's just the way things are. But I think the, yeah, the, the large. It seems that quantum coherence operates over macroscopic scales. That's, an, that's a new thing. That's something Planck and Schrodinger and Einstein did not know. And we know that now. And do you think that could shed some light on some of the things those physicists I quoted earlier were saying about the, 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 it seems that consciousness is, is in some way fundamental? I, I, I think in, in eventually, yes. I think it's on the cutting edge of understanding the fundamentals of, of um, the, the principles of quantum mechanics. I think this is one of the more exciting areas, partly because it's in direct contact with observation and experiment. Uh, at last, and, um, at last. And, and yet it's addressing these, some of these fundamental issues. Mm. And it seems a very, a very um, tackleable... It's, a, it's both a down-to-earth problem, how, how big a quantum system can we build and maintain, and it's also addressing 
the fundamental issue of what does it mean to collapse a wave function, what does it actually mean to draw a line between quantum systems and classical systems. And so I think in the end, yes, this is the most promising way of addressing those issues. Yeah. And it certainly brings people like us who like concrete kind of experimental proof uh, a little bit closer to to actually, you know, saying this stuff could be real as as mind-boggling as it may be so what's next for the team john before we say goodbye you've you've discovered the higgs um great to have physical proof of that but presumably you've now got to rerun the thing about a million times to start to understand what that actually means yeah i mean you, you if you sort the data you see the error bars that shrink as you get more data and that's basically i'm um, telling those more about the properties of the higgs and whether it really is as predicted in the standard model or whether it really has other things going on. And as I said right at the beginning, we're, we're, we're exploring eastward on this map. So we know, for instance, there are whole issues like um, we don't understand why the universe isn't made of equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Um, we don't understand gravity and how it fits into the theory. There's a, this, you may have heard of the issue of dark matter. We try and predict gravitational observations, astrophysical observations from our known theory and we have to, to do that properly. We have to postulate a new kind of matter, which we haven't actually observed in the lab, so we'd like to see if we can see that. Um, so, yeah, we're exploring that east, beyond the eastern seaboard. We've had a map from the theorists that told us where the Higgs should be, um, and we went and found it. We have no map now. We're basically the, the map in my book of Atomland, where we've explored that map. We've still got things to explore on it. Um, the blind leading the blind. Tell. But now we're off, well, yeah, the, 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 the LHC is essentially sailing off into the ocean hoping that we'll uh, hit some new land and be able to explore that when we're there. Or at the very least, we'll know how far the ocean goes up to a point. So, well, yeah. John, congratulations on the discovery. It must have been such a relief after so many years of it being theorized and nothing more reassuring than finding it in the real world. John, thank you so much. And I really, really appreciate you taking the effort to help the public get a better head around this because I do believe when you know when you read about, you know, quantum teleportation of information, you realize that this this has practical uses, you know, it's going to be used for cybersecurity, potentially for a quantum internet. You know, we need to understand this in order to understand you know, if we want to fund it, if we want to, uh, if it's safe and all this sort of stuff. So folk like yourselves and like Brian and like Sean who are, who are willing to, to, to sort of come out of the, the very deep level of work that you're doing and help us understand this on a sort of people level. So listeners, you must go off and, um, you know, read Smashing Physics, uh, which tells the story of that search for the Higgs. And then um, also John's more recent book, um, which is all about Atomland. And not to mention, not to forget, of course, that you can follow his work on the Guardian blog. That I, how often does that come out, John? How often do you write? Actually, it? sorry, the Guardian blog's been stopped now. They stopped oh, no, because I've been reading all of the old articles. That's a shame. And are yeah, you... I still write. The, the, there's, um, so the blog moved to a place called the um, Cosmic Shambles Network. Cosmic Shambles? Cosmic Shambles Network. Go have a look there. There's a whole bunch of good science blogs. A lot of the people who were writing for the Guardian went over there, including me. So can't have a Well, look there. thank you very much for that tip, John. I shall make sure that gets on the show notes. Thank you very, very much, John. And maybe yeah. we can speak again someday if I, if I have a few other unresolved questions. Okay. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, John. 